Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Ancient Africa encounters the 21st century. The city lies on the edge of the vast savanna. Giraffes, zebras and rhinos at the front door. The Maasai still tend their cattle, as they have done for generations. Where the city and the savanna meet, conflict cannot be avoided. Armed park rangers are needed to protect more than three million people from the animals. Is this a glimpse of Africa's future? When a wild buffalo gets into the city, news spreads fast. The situation is life-threatening for humans and almost certainly fatal for the buffalo. By crossing the boundary fence, it has sealed its own fate. Buffalo are some of Africa's most dangerous animals. Rangers from Kenya's Wildlife Service have no choice but to put the animal down. As Nairobi's population grows, sites like this are more and more common. But without men like Moses Coretto of the Kenya Wildlife Service, far more animals would lose their lives. Nairobi is the economic capital of East Africa, headquarters to multinational companies and NGOs. It's also a popular base for tourists who come to see Africa's spectacular wildlife. But sometimes the wildlife gets too close. Great excitement by the side of a main road. A few minutes ago, someone sighted a lion. Wildlife service rangers are already on the scene. Wildlife service vet Edward Kariuki has a tranquilizer gun. But they find no sign of a lion. Just the paw print of a very big cat. For sure we have seen the footprint, but it's very hard getting it now. We are, we are not sure whether it has crossed over the road, or maybe it has run out of this place to another bush. The crowd starts to move on. The lion has vanished. The plan now is for us to withdraw and try to get a good team that can come and clear out the place. They will have to walk from every part of bush to make sure that there is nothing. The armed men of the Kenya Wildlife Service are doing an impossible job. They have to protect the wildlife from people and the people from wildlife. We have not found it, but I know it will be found, especially in the, in the evening. It might be seen. If it's around this area, this area is, has a lot of people. They're going to have to, to, uh, to, 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 to get the reports from the people here. The problem is that Nairobi is situated on the borders of a national park. Theoretically, there's a continuous fence between the houses and the open savanna. 
On one side is 21st century city, on the other, timeless Africa. The peaceful coexistence of wild animals and people depends on the sturdiness of the fence between them. Any holes or breaks let lions, leopards or buffalo into residential areas. And there are plenty of gaps. Wire is a valuable resource and in places, the fence has disappeared entirely. It's a tragedy for the animals and a challenge for the rangers. Constant patrols monitor the length of the fence. Holes are repaired as quickly as possible and stray animals are driven back to the other side or put down. So that means six strands of the... Here, most of the original cut. fence is gone. So you have seen it's, a bit, it's about six kilometers. One kilometer, isn't it? One kilometer. The Wildlife Service does its best zero to allow six. animals and people zero to five, live side four, by side. Nine, eight, five, one, three, zero, two, is it? Correct. Time? But time 16, is running out. Six. 16, 46 hours. 100 hours. The southern side of Nairobi's National Park has no fence. This open boundary allows animals to make their traditional migrations as they have done for thousands of years. But the city is growing at an alarming rate. Development is threatening to close off this last crucial corridor to the outside world. Conflict between man and wildlife is escalating. The evening news brings more stories of increasing tension. A lion has killed a farmer's only cow. It will be the lion's death sentence. Actually, the killing of a, a cow is ahead of a lion. We just kill a lion because we got no any other alternative. This is the flip side of Nairobi's closeness to nature. In a country where livelihood can depend on a single cow, the deadly actions of a lion are not so easily forgiven. The south side of the park at first seems untouched by these troubles. Almost as in ancient times, the Maasai herd their cattle. In a fast-changing world, they're determined to hang on to their traditions. But the Maasai have also played their part in the growing conflict. Selling their land to developers has resulted in more factories and more fences. The Maasai live mainly in the southeast of the park. They graze their cattle in the corridor that connects the national park to the open savanna. It's a precarious situation because this is the only migration corridor left for the wild animals. That means lions use it too. Livestock and large predators are uneasy neighbors. Their cattle are the Maasai's livelihood and they can't afford to lose any to the big cats. Lions are the biggest threat. I heard the dogs barking. We were in bed, asleep. Then the lion approached and the cattle started to urinate with fear. Then the lion attacked one of the cows. It was over there. We heard the cattle bellowing. Then we knew the lion had killed one of the cows. I went outside with my husband. He had his spear and I had a knife. The lion dragged the cow off and we followed. When the lion saw us, he ran away. This is what we use to kill lions. When a lion comes and attacks a cow, Then you stab it like this. 
All this a stone's throw from a densely populated city. The Maasai want to live peacefully alongside the wild animals, but it can only work if the large prey the lions need can continue their traditional migrations. Sometimes when we're in this area, we come across nearly 20 lions, or at least 17 or 18. It's like a park here, not for the people, but for the lions. When other animals migrate through, the lions follow them and vanish. Sometimes two or three months pass when we don't see a single zebra here. The lions have followed them. Soon there will be little habitat left for lions or for the Maasai. Today, the biggest hope for Africa's wildlife is the tourist industry. Even the Maasai have come to realize this. Tourism and agriculture are Kenya's two biggest industries. It's a simple equation. No lions, no income. The Kenya Wildlife Service understands this better than anyone. We've been called out to drive off a pride of lions. There are eight of them. So we'll team up with the village guards. The lions look very hungry, so we need to get them back quickly into the park. If they get too close to the village, they'll attack the cattle. That's why we have to scare them away. The aim is to chase the lions back to the safety of the national park. The gunfire is meant to frighten, not to kill them. Scenes like this are being played out all across Africa. <laughs> Large wild animals and predators can only survive where heavily armed guards patrol park fences and track down poachers. <laughs> It's the price we pay for an ever-growing human population. Nairobi National Park and the fate of its wild animals is a disturbing picture. But the rest of Africa's wildlife may well follow suit. Vast open plains crisscrossed by chain link fences. Hey boys. Sandy hey, Simpson hey, is determined to prevent it happening here hey, in hey, his hey. home territory. Come on boys. How are we doing? Good. Hey, boys. After working in the art transport business in Europe, Sandy has returned home to his native Kenya. Now he spends his time protecting its wildlife. These lions were rescued by him at the very last moment. One day Sandy hopes to release the lions back into the wild, maybe even into neighboring Nairobi National Park. Ndevu, you're falling asleep. Ndevu. Okay, let's go and get you some food. Come on. Sandy is one of a growing number of Kenyans who have recognized that wild animals are this country's great asset. Sandy is fortunate. He has both the time and the money to invest in his passion. He wants to see everyone join forces to protect Kenya's wildlife. So he buys meat to feed his lions from the local Maasai. The Maasai depend upon their livestock for their survival. 
They don't hunt or eat wild animals. They only come into conflict with them if their cattle are in danger. For a Maasai, his wealth and status is measured by the number of livestock he owns and how many children he has. Sandy respects and understands this way of life. In a meeting of two very different cultures, each side has the same hopes to prevent further breakup and destruction of the natural landscape and to stop more fences going up. They quickly agree on a fair price. This is not the first time they've done business. They decide which animal will meet its fate today. Sandy has to buy fresh livestock every week to keep his lions well fed. It's an expensive business, but he can afford it. The Maasai, on the other hand, can't afford to lose a cow each week to a predator. The journey to Sandy's lion enclosure on the outskirts of the national park takes him through a large old cattle ranch. This ranch is privately owned and could be a sign of hope for conservationists. Securing this land would safeguard the migration corridor out of the national park. It could stay open. In the meantime, Sandy focuses his energy on the lions. Uh, the reason I keep the lions is really to keep them safe. Uh, when they first escaped from the park, they were out in this area and killing a lot of uh, the Maasai cattle and sheep and goats. And of course, the people then wanted to kill them. Uh, and really, today, the only solution to keep those lions alive is really to keep them as I am. Every single lion is precious, and there are no easy solutions. Landowners refuse to be dictated to. The conservationists want to keep everything as it was. The Maasai are trying to preserve their traditional lifestyle. The hey people boys. of Nairobi want more Hi, land, Devu. and the government Hi, needs more come tourists. Hey, come on, boys. Come on, Edimu. The lions, Edimu. as ever, want their oh, dinner. Okay, here we go. This is for Endeavour. Come on, Eddie. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Come on, Devu. In you come. Good boy, Devu. Hey, come on, Devu. Come on. Good boy. Hey. Come on, calm down, calm down. Sandy Simpson often thinks back to the very different Africa of his childhood, when Nairobi had only one-seventh of the population and the surrounding land was still open savanna. The men from the Kenya Wildlife Service have to deal with the harsh realities of Africa today. The rangers have been called out by a herdsman. One of his precious sheep has been attacked by a leopard. Head ranger Moses Coretto has to be both policeman and counselor. Here as before, the predator got in through a gap in the fence. Okay. 
The leopard is long gone. There's nothing the rangers can do but repair the fence. The sheep's owner, however, is hoping for some compensation. At first sight, the sheep doesn't seem to be injured. But a closer look reveals its wounds. The animal's fate is sealed. There's nothing more the rangers can do. Leopards are elusive animals. They are rarely seen, but the rangers find their tracks everywhere. So leopards, generally they can survive in any environment, in any habitat. Even in cities, in big cities like Nairobi National, Nairobi, this is the capital of Kenya, we have uh, reports of leopards. They go after the dogs. You know, there are people who, who keep these very big dogs, like the white people. They kill. The western side of Nairobi is the affluent part of the city. There's plenty of food here for the big cats, and being close to the national park, it also attracts other wild animals. Manicured lawns are popular with warthogs. But the tranquility of the large gardens and family houses is deceptive. Dog lovers Tony and Betty Arthur have had a traumatic experience. When Tony came back quite late one night, um, I opened the front door and uh, Baloo, our little dog, um, dashed out barking. Um, no doubt smelt the leopard or something. Um, and anyway, it took off to the left of the house and um, uh, suddenly the, the bark stopped at mid-bark and uh, we realized something terrible had happened because um, there had been other dogs missing in the neighborhood. And um, anyway, that was the end of our beloved little dog called Baloo, who was much mourned by our family because it was such a character. And um, the only thing we basically have left now are, are these photographs I've got in several albums of Baloo, who, who was such a charming little dog. Uh, the, the day after our little dog Baloo was taken, uh, a friend came round, he'd heard about this too, and we found, he found a, a big track of the leopard in, in mud, and uh, actually made a, a print with plaster of Paris, which actually I'm holding in my hand now. As you can see, it's, it's a very big track indeed, and all, all of us believe we know anything about leopards, and it must have been, probably weighed well over 200 pounds. The leopard that took poor Baloo must have been an exceptionally big male. These big cats have been seen inside Nairobi city limits since the 1970s. Leopards are far more adaptable than lions, and little deters them. Certainly not a pair of jackals. It's not clear how many leopards are prowling the city. What is clear? is that it's virtually impossible to find or shoot one in the densely populated residential areas. If there's trouble outside the city, the rangers will sometimes resort to setting a trap. You cannot easily catch a leopard. You cannot easily even see it, because it's a very secretive animal. It knows how to camouflage knows how to adapt it to the environment. So this animal is very, very cunning and very, very intelligent. In the case of the injured sheep, Moses Coretto orders a trap to be set to reassure the owner that something is being done. Should a leopard actually enter the cage, it will learn a lesson for life. 
Once an animal has been in a trap, it gives the area a wide berth in the future. The goat, locked up as bait, won't get hurt. It's safe in a separate section of the cage. The leopard can't reach it, but they all know he's gone and he's unlikely to come back. Leopards are not the only predators that come into the city. One area of Nairobi is notorious for animal incursions. The stench of rotting hangs in the air. Farm animals from all over the country are brought here to be slaughtered and processed in Kenya's largest slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse provides employment for great numbers of people. From here, the meat is distributed throughout the city as fast as possible. In the hot climate, it starts to go off within hours. There's no time to be too precious, and nothing is wasted. Loaded onto vehicles, large and small, the precious load is rushed to the farthest corners of Nairobi. The hides and skins stay behind. They'll be turned into leather. And the offal and indigestible scraps are discarded. They fill a sizable waste dump and attract scavengers of all kinds. <laughs> I have been here a long time. For the last four years, I have worked with the animal skins. The birds don't bother me. They're only looking for food. I do my job while they look for food, then they leave again. I wouldn't dream of killing them. They haven't done me any harm. This swamp of rotting meat with its hooves and horns is an attractive meal for the dogs and birds that spend hours here, picking at the remains. Marabou storks and ibis are also attracted by the rich pickings. They feed on the offal and the many worms and maggots that thrive here. The great congregation of birds attracted to the dumps also spill over onto the surrounding fields. For the smallholders living here, this can be disastrous. Mrs. Noroga only has this tiny field and a few animals to feed herself and her children. I am just a poor farmer. When I go to the market, I buy beans and corn seeds and plant them in the field. But then the marabou stalks come and eat them. So I have to go and buy more. That's very upsetting, because seeds are expensive and we have very little money. But if I don't buy new seeds, my children will go hungry. For small farmers like Mrs. Niroga, struggling to make a living around the slaughterhouse, these apparently harmless birds can ruin all her work. There seems to be no way out. If I chase the marabous with stones, then they fly away. 
but the government says it's illegal to kill storks. And if I put out poison for them, my chickens might eat it too and die. Her husband works as a day labourer at the slaughterhouse. This is their main source of income, so they've learnt to live with the downside of the job. They've grown used to the stench of rotting meat and the scavenging birds. But there is one thing that worries them both, the hyenas. They come out after the sun has set. It was nine o'clock one evening, just as I was going to bed. I heard a noise coming from the goats. I had a nanny goat with two kids and was just about to sell them so that I could open a shop and pay for my children to go to school. But then I heard the goats bleating an alarm. When I rushed outside, I saw a hyena run off. It had attacked the goats. I shouted for my neighbors and we followed the hyena, but it had escaped into the bush and when I came home, all three goats were dead. No one knows where the hyenas hide out during the day, but most likely it's in the national park. The stench of the slaughterhouse draws them from many kilometers away. With hungry youngsters to feed, it's a guaranteed and plentiful supply of food. Until the 1960s, a premium was paid for every hyena killed. They were poisoned in large numbers. Today, the hyena population is slowly recovering. But as hyena numbers grow, so does the conflict between man and beast. We don't go outside at night because we're scared of hyenas. If you go out, you're likely to meet one. They come looking for our goats, so we stay inside until the morning light. The slaughterhouse is a long way from the hyena's home territory, so the animals approach cautiously. First, they send a scout. The rest of the pack waits in the wings. Something seems to be making the scout nervous. A farmer with a gun. Something stirs in the pit of rotting waste. The hyena decides it's too dangerous and retreats. But it was only a banded mongoose. Jackals are less timid than hyenas and approach more confidently. It's another world. Jackals and hyenas feeding on offal Leopards killing dogs, lions that take down cattle. But most of Nairobi's population never come into contact with any dangerous wild animals. They're more likely to encounter some gentler animal residents of the city. To find them, you just stroll downtown to the city park. White-throated Ganon. These forest monkeys are as common here as squirrels or pigeons elsewhere. They live in small social groups and have no fear of human visitors. If they want something, they take it.
The park and its monkeys are one of Nairobi's great attractions. Most visitors don't mind sharing their picnic. The park has been an oasis for the city's inhabitants for over 70 years, and people and monkeys have learned to live together. Others, too, have discovered that life within the city can have its advantages. These marabou storks, with their three-meter wingspans, have made their nests in the middle of a traffic island. They are Nairobi's most iconic birds and the traffic island where they nest each year has become famous. The birds seem undisturbed by the passing traffic. No other wild animal has been able to adapt to city life in quite the same way. Marabou get much of their food by scavenging, and the city's garbage dumps provide ample opportunity. The young chicks in the nests will not go hungry and may well do better than their cousins beyond the city limits. But why did the storks move to the city? The worrying truth is that their natural habitats have changed. Nowadays, the marabou struggle to find suitable nest sites and sufficient food in the wild. The most important source of food for the city storks is the Dandora dump site, the largest rubbish tip in East Africa. It stretches across 13 hectares of land, the area of 18 football pitches. For the marabous, this is a daily picnic spot. They root through the garbage looking for scraps of anything edible, and they are not fussy eaters. The Dandora dump doesn't just attract storks. This part of the city is home to around a million people, many with little or no income. They come to the rubbish dump to scratch a meager living. Sasa, tunakujaga asubui. When we come here in the mornings, we wait until the trucks arrive. Then we collect anything that can be sold. In the evening, everything gets weighed. The money we earn is for our children. When things go well, we get around 70 cents. In times like these, there is no other work, and we need the money for our children. The first garbage trucks arrive and the waiting masses start to move. The trucks carry agricultural waste, household rubbish, and even clinical refuse from hospitals. Every day they bring over 2,000 tons of rubbish. People and birds work side by side. Together, they are the most efficient recycling team. Nothing is missed or wasted. It's smelly and dirty, but there's more deadly downside to working here. The refuse contains high concentrations of heavy metals like lead, mercury, and cadmium. It's in the ground and in the dust, quietly poisoning birds and people. I've worked here for seven years, collecting plastics, metal, and canisters. For every usable piece, I get 12 cents. The money my wife and I earn here pays the rent. 
These birds are very useful. They clean up the country by eating the dead animals, like cats. So they are very smart. The marabou storks may find plenty of food, but they're also building up high levels of lead, just like the children who live in this area. More than half of them have dangerously high concentrations of lead in their blood. And yet, it's a peaceful scene. Birds and people working side by side, respecting the needs of the other. It seems that in Nairobi, the poorest are the most content to live in harmony with wild animals. The marabou stork watch us working and they come nearer. They are all around us and are happy when we find something. We allow them to take meat and bread and then we eat together. From the vibrancy of city life to the vast open savanna and beyond, where there are no fences and where Africa is how it should be. This is the famous migration corridor, and this is Sandy Simpson's hope for the future. Here we are on the Athi Kapiti Plains, which is an area only about three kilometers away from Nairobi National Park. And it is a very important migration area for a lot of wildlife that comes all the way from Amboseli and Chulu Hills down in this direction, right through up here into the National Park. With all the problems of human pressure, Nairobi expanding, it's really becoming very important for us to save this area in order to have the possibility of a corridor into the national park. But right next door, the city is encroaching further and further into the savannah. This vast land, which once saw huge herds of migrating beasts, is now fragmented and transformed. Houses, fences and factories scar the ground. More and more roads are being constructed. Wild animals seem out of place here. A few months ago, there was still a narrow corridor here, barely a hundred meters wide. It allowed zebra, buffalo and gnus to cross the road into and out of the national park during the night. This passage is now gone. Today, there is only one single corridor left, Sandy Simpson's last hope. My dream here really is to try and create this area as a wildlife conservancy, um, to have it fully protected, and then to try and build a corridor into Nairobi National Park in order to allow the movement of animals from the park all the way through this area, down to Amboseli and across to the Chulu Hills. The annual migration of the herds across the savannah is one of Africa's great wildlife spectacles. But the distances covered are becoming smaller every year as more and more land is developed. Large grazing animals that cannot migrate are like birds that can't fly.
The corridor which Sandy and his friends are fighting to conserve is over 200 kilometers long. Its fate will determine whether Nairobi continues to be the gateway to Africa's natural world. It's a last desperate stand, effectively. If it's not done within the very, very near future, I think if it's not secured even within the next year or so, then unfortunately the, the park will become an island and therefore a zoo which will effectively have to be managed. Is this Africa's future? Giant zoos replacing the open savanna? Nairobi's wildlife orphanage gives a glimpse of what may be in store. A leopard behind bars. The children are fascinated. The orphanage has been here for nearly 50 years and belongs to the national park. It's had to deal with many wildlife casualties over the decades. Edward Kariuki is the resident vet. Over the years, the orphanage has become one of the most popular wildlife attractions for local Kenyans. The animals Edward cares for are victims of Kenya's growing human population. We usually have a lot of animals that we receive in Nairobi, in Nairobi National Park and Nairobi orphanage from Nairobi area. Some of them are due to accidents and we get a lot of the injured ones here at the orphanage. We also get orphans from the Masai land area whereby we, the massa is mostly kill the, the lions because of preying on their livestock. And in that instance, we usually get some of the cubs that are out of the mothers that have been killed. Here in the orphanage zoo, these beautiful and adorable cubs are safe and will pose no danger to people. In fact, they are probably safer here than in the wild. They even have their own private doctor. Perhaps our romantic image of the natural world is just a myth created by man. Maybe animals don't mind being surrounded by fences, curious tourists, or mounds of rubbish. By the end of this century, Africa's human population will have trebled. Not good news for the animals. Nairobi may be an indicator of what could happen right across the African continent. In future, traditional lifestyles like those of the Maasai may only survive in protected reserves. Everywhere, armed guards in uniform may have to resolve conflicts between animals and people. National parks could be surrounded by fences, and wild animals may only be seen in traps or enclosures, looking out at the tourists from behind bars. Nairobi could well be a blueprint for the future. Whether the rest of Africa follows remains to be seen. There's still a little time to turn the tide. <laughs>